Hello everyone, I'm Nico and I'm currently teaching English in Beijing, China. Hi, I'm Roxy. I'm an online English teacher and I teach children from all over the world. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Mark and I'll be presenting to you this afternoon. I'm near Cardiff in a very wet and miserable Wales. Um, please say hi in the chat and tell me where you're from this afternoon. It'll be great to, to hear from you. So let's see who we've got. So we've got a hi there from Nafisi. So hello to you. Hi to Petro. Good afternoon. And we've got a few people from a uh, very cold South Africa as well. Um, uh, hi to Arash there in Iran. Okay, uh, Cass in South Africa, Cynthia in Spain, hello. Delph in South, South Africa. Welcome to you. Okay, so uh, during my time in education, I've taught all ages and levels. And once you start teaching, you're likely to see that you're going to teach a variety of ages and um, ages and levels from absolute beginners. So I've taught five year olds to proficiencies, uh, proficiency level students and people in their 60s. Um, and I've also trained uh, teachers from uh, trained teachers in classroom management so that they can get the most from their students um, and that both their students and the teacher themselves can enjoy being in the classroom and that's what we're going to look at uh, a little bit this afternoon so in all the time that I've been doing teacher training um, recruitment and things like this it's classroom management that many people are most concerned about. And the idea of having to deal with behavior in the classroom can seem very daunting. And often people think that it's teenage classes that are going to give them the biggest problems when it comes to classroom management issues. Uh, however, that's not necessarily the case. Any class can be a problem classes of teenagers can be great fun. Uh, so the key is actually careful planning and thinking about what you want to achieve. So the first thing you need to do is to think about the class that you're teaching and to start to consider what issues they might have. So it could be that you're teaching a class of very young, young learners typically around four to five years old and the issues that they could have will be having very limited experience of being in a classroom i remember a class that i was teaching 
it was their first experience of learning English and their first experience of being in a classroom. So they had a lot to learn. With learners like this, it's really important that you keep activities short, just a couple of minutes per activity and activities that involve lots of repetition. Material needs to be visual, as well as doing things like videos and songs. And at this age, it's unlikely that you're going to be doing any reading or writing. Then you move on to young learners who are typically around six to 11 or six to 12 years old. They usually have some experience of being in the classroom and they possibly already have some English skills as well. In fact, by the time that they're 11, um, they could have very high levels of English. So there can actually be a very big difference between teaching six-year-olds and 11 or 12-year-olds. So it's important the materials that you use are age appropriate. What interests a class of six-year-olds is really unlikely to have the same interest for an 11-year-old. Then after that, you move on to the teenage classes. Teenage classes are typically 13 to 16, possibly 13 to 18. Um, and as with your young learners, there can be a wide variety in ability from, uh, from beginners to advanced level learners. Uh, clearly, teenagers are able to focus on tasks for young for longer than young learners and they're able to deal with more complex ideas as well however your lessons still need to be engaging and varied and also remember that teenagers tend to be very self-conscious so they don't like the, a spotlight being put on them for example and then finally you've got adults and you can see there adults can be 16 plus so the first thing that that means is that your adult students aren't necessarily adults. They could very well still be teenagers and behaving and interacting with people in the way that a teenager might do. Adults can be false beginners to advanced and they could be learning English for a wide range of reasons. So it could be for personal reasons, or study or work. Adults tend to need to see things written down to be more confident um, that they're correct before they're willing to say something. And also the reason that they're learning English can affect their motivation when they're in class. So they may be more or less willing to engage with things depending on why they're there. So before teaching, it's really important to think about your classroom rules. So what do you want to happen in your classroom? So I typically have a list of around 10 rules that I use in my classroom and they evolve a little bit over time as my classes change. Um, uh, but I basically have those rules, okay? So I know what I want to happen in my class. I also think about how I want my class to start and end, and that's something that we'll come on to later. It's important to think about what behavior you will accept in class and what you won't accept, and then you have to be ready to stick to that. So there's, you know, you can't, be stricter one day and then the next day because you've had some good news or um, something good has happened, you're a bit more relaxed and people get away with things. You've got to be consistent. And that's what all of your students are looking for. And it's important that the most important thing, I think, for classroom management is thinking about the tasks and activities that will engage your students. It's all well and good having clear rules. It's all well and good having um, your expectations of the behaviour that you will accept. But to really help classroom management and to make sure that your classes run as well as possible, you need to think about the tasks and activities 
that will keep your class engaged and working. So in your very first lesson with a new group, the first thing that you need to do is to agree the rules. So the way that I do this is I get my students, um, whether they are young learners, teenagers or adults, as long as they're able to communicate in English, they can do this task. So I put them into groups and I get them to discuss in their group what they think the rules should be for our classroom. And they maybe write down a list, they come up with ideas, they discuss it together. Then once they've done that, I bring the whole class back together and I elicit from my students the, the rules that they've come up with. So then that gives me the opportunity, as I'm writing what they've said on the board, I can rephrase things to, to suit um, the rules that I want to have in place. If it's something that's not really um, not not really necessary, so that they might sometimes go like very overboard and they'll say, oh, we have to be silent in class or something like this, you know, and you say, well, no, that's not really necessary. You don't need to be silent. So in that case, that'll be something you don't write up at all. Um, they might say things like, oh, the teacher's not going to give, give us homework um, or things like that. So again, they're things you say, oh, okay, well done. That's a really good idea. Perhaps we'll come back to that later and then you can move on to another one. So by the time you've finished, you've got your, your set of rules on the board, um, which are the rules that you wanted anyway. So here's an example of the type of rules that I would have for my class. So we all agree, you, you can see at the top, it says we all agree to respect each other, to listen, when a teacher or another student speaks. And that's really important as well, because very, very often somebody will put up their hands and they'll say, you know, when you're listing the rules, they'll say, oh, we have to listen to the teacher. And so it's worth pointing out at that point that yes, you do, but you also have to listen to each other. We'll raise our hands to speak. Don't bully or laugh at anyone, which you could say is similar to respect. But I think that it's worth putting that separately and pointing out that, um, you know, everyone's here to try their best. Everyone's going to make mistakes, including me. I'll make mistakes as well. Um, but I don't want you to be singling people out or laughing at them. Um, mobile phones, mobile phones should be turned off or put on silent and they should be completely out of the way. Um, no eating or drinking during class. Maybe water is okay. Um, but no eating during class. Come on time, um, bring everything you need to every lesson. Uh, no L1, so that's first language. So as much as possible, you want your students communicating and everything that's happening in the class to be in English, to be in the target language. And then of course, homework, so do homework on time. So when you're in class, it's really important, as I mentioned earlier, to be consistent. Your students, especially your teenagers, will, um, will understand very clearly if they think that you're not being fair. So if you're treating someone differently or if you're behaving in a way that's different to how you behave before. And if they think that you're not being fair, they will tell you. And this can lead, in some cases, to a bigger conflict and more difficulties in class. Also, what you'll find is that some of your students, and again, you tends to be your teenagers, they know the rules, but then they want to see where the boundaries are. So they'll start to push those rules to see, you know, what can I get away with? So when you say no mobile phones, what do you mean? So it's at that point that you have to be really clear and you have to make sure, right, these are the rules. These are what we agreed to. OK, so you need to, to follow the rules and then follow whatever procedure you're going to put in place. But once they realise that that's the boundary, 
and they can't um, do anything beyond that. They have got to follow the rules. That then they're ha they're happy and they're willing to do that. So with the rules, of course, stick to the agreed rules. Don't add more. Your students won't like this. I've seen teachers try this before and it really never ends well. When the teacher says, right, I'm adding a new rule to our class, to our, our rules, uh, there's a big argument about that. Using positive reinforcement. It's probably something a lot of you have heard about before, but it's really important. Sometimes it can be really difficult, but it's a good thing to try. So how I start and end the class. I will start the class by getting everyone to come in, take their seats, get their books out, and then I will do the register, even with a class that I know well. I'll still do the register just so that everyone then understands, right, okay, it's time to quiet down, it's time to, to be speaking English, um, the class has started. I'll check homework. I might not go through and check the answers, but it'll just be, can you show me your homework? I'll go around and do that. So we know that the class has started. And then at the end of the class, I tell the students to leave according to how I want them to leave. So it might be that I tell them by name who can go and in what order, rather than everyone sort of piling out the classroom in one go. So if you do something like that, if you if you name students to go, then it will tend to be the students who have been really well behaved or done really well in class that are able to go first of all. But that does mean if you've got a student who is getting into some trouble, not serious trouble, but doing you know, minor things wrong every lesson, that they're constantly going to be one of the last to leave. And it could be, well, there's no point in me even trying because I'm always I'm going to be last anyway. I might as well be last. So positive reinforcement comes in in here then because you're going around and you're looking at people's work and you say, oh, that's really good work there. Oh, you've done really well. Well done. And then at the end of the class, you can, you know, when everyone's packing up and they're getting ready to leave, you can say, oh, and so, John, you did really good work today. You worked really well. I was really impressed. You can go first. So that person who is normally perhaps last, they get to go first. OK, um, so positive reinforcements, something like that can really um, be beneficial. When you're in the lesson, don't make threats that you can't or you won't carry out. Oh, this is really important. Um, now, this can range from the usually it's just something that a teacher says without thinking all right and this can range from the idea of right well i'm going to get you kicked out of the school because of your behavior well unless you are the person who is responsible for um, admitting or removing students from the school then it's unlikely that you're going to be able to do that and that's going to make you look weak because you've made a threat and then next lesson they're still going to be there and so that's going to affect your relationship so um yeah do make sure if it's a threat make sure it's something that you will carry you will be able to carry out um, another one i saw a teacher i was with a teacher on an excursion and um there was a group of boys and they weren't doing anything particularly bad. They were just throwing stones down a, a, a hill. There was nobody there. wasn't doing anyone any harm, but it was clearly irritating her. And she turned around and said, if you throw stones again, I'm going to throw stones at you. And it's like, oh, why would you say that? You're clearly not going to do that. So be careful. Okay. Think, just have a moment's pause before you say something. Don't humiliate. All right, that's obviously a really big one. Uh, even if they are doing something to you, um, still don't humiliate them, okay? It's really difficult. I've seen such a lot of problems uh, because of teachers humiliating a student in class. And it means the student can't or won't go back into that class again. 
So really do think think about that. And again, it's just having that moment before you say something, just think, is this the right thing to say? Okay. And be aware of that. Uh, like I've already mentioned, be fair, treat everyone the same, every lesson. Try and imagine that you've got some kind of like barrier at your classroom door. And as you walk through, anything that's happened outside just gets left behind. So any problems that you've had, any disagreements you've had with people, that all gets left outside. And you're, you're in class and you're dealing with this group of students. Um, that even can mean that when you are dealing with this group of students, how they behaved last time, that's forgotten as well. That's last time. Don't worry about it. OK, treat this as a new class. If you have a student who is being disruptive, who is causing you problems, it can be a really good idea to speak to that student separately to find out what the problem is. And it kind of links to the not humiliating them um, that I mentioned earlier on. So a good thing to do is to get the class working. So they're doing an exercise and then you can go over to this person. You can say, all right, um, you know, why were you, you know, on your phone or why were you shouting out or why were you, whatever the problem was, okay? And you can you can speak to them quietly, you can speak to them one-to-one. -one. And because everyone else is working, nobody else is really paying attention to the conversation that you're having with them. It's going to make the student much more, com much more comfortable, much more willing to admit their mistakes as well, okay? And that leads on to admitting mistakes. As teachers, we're human. We're human. And we make mistakes, all right? We're not robots. Sometimes we get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, the best thing to do is admit it, all right? Don't say things like, oh, I was just trying to see if you were awake. Oh, I'm trying to see if you'd notice. Don't say that. Just say, oh, yeah, I made a mistake. I'm really sorry. Um, that was wrong. Um, let me sort it out now, okay? Your students will have so much more respect for you if you admit mistakes okay so do think about that and that's a really important thing to do so you've got through the lesson and now after the lesson you need to think about what has gone on during that class so it can be a good idea sometimes to keep a note of your thoughts, whether it's on the lesson plan or in um, in uh, like a diary or something like that uh, about the lesson, especially when you start teaching. So first of all, it's really important to think about what went well. Sometimes that can be really difficult if you've had a really hard class to think about what went well. But that's really important. It's really important for you. It's like, well, Actually, I know that they were really loud and really boisterous for a lot of the lesson. But actually, there was that one bit where I asked them to sit down and do their grammar task, where actually everyone was quiet, everyone was doing the task. So actually, I did manage to get them to do that. Think about activities that were particularly successful. And think about why they were successful. Um, and on the flip side, think about any activities that didn't go as planned and think about why that was. And that's essential to do that because sometimes you'll be you'll be planning your classes and you think, oh, I've got a great, oh, I've got a great activity. My students are going to love this activity. And when you're in class, for whatever reason, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work as you expected. The students don't engage with it in the way you expected. It's it's just a, a disaster, basically. So you need to think about why that is. If that happens, by the way stop the task if you're doing an activity and you can clearly see it's not working just stop it and do something else okay think about any issues that you had with a particular class uh, or with sorry with the class in general or with a particular student um, and think about why you had those issues sometimes it could be things that have happened outside the classroom now i've lived I've lived in places where 
um, the first day of snow can cause people to come into classroom and be uh, a, a bit crazy. Windy days can cause children to be a bit crazy as well. Um, and, you know, it makes it more difficult to calm them down. Um, but also it could be other reasons. It could be conflicts between two students in the class. Maybe something's happened um, outside the classroom and that's caused uh, some conflict. So it's important to think about that. Or if it's a particular student, maybe you had difficulties with a particular student and think about why that is. Um, very often, you know, teachers can be, you know, I've heard lots of times, teachers talk about students as, you know, oh, that student's really bad, or he's such a problem, or, you know, things like this. And that could well be true. But if you know that a student is a problem, what can you do as a teacher to make the situation easier? How can you teach a class in a way that means that that student isn't being um, as difficult as perhaps they usually are? So if you've had a problem with a student, first, you know, think about what could you do differently? So sometimes that, that's what I will always do first. I will always think, right, what did I do? Is there anything that I could have done that would have brought a different outcome? And sometimes I will think, oh, do you know what? Uh, I know that that particular student was really difficult in class, but perhaps I focused too much on, on their bad behavior. So next lesson, I need to make sure that I remember to focus on positive things with that student. So thinking about the lesson in general, is there anything that you would change next time you taught that lesson? Um, so any activities or any parts of the lesson or any things that you'd swap around or do differently? And then thinking about the class and the, the individuals in the class, is there anything that you would do differently next time you're teaching them? So it could be moving them around into different places, um, the way that you are interacting with them. Uh, do you need to change that? Um, do you need to change your position in the classroom, for example? Uh, sometimes you'll see teachers who spend a lot of their time sat at the front of the class. Well, if you happen to be that teacher, perhaps moving around the classroom could help. If, you're, if you spend a lot of time at the front, at the board, maybe having tasks where the students are focused on what they're doing instead will help the classroom management as well. And the most important thing to remember, if you're having difficulties with a class or with a student, is to ask for help. When you're in a classroom and you close that classroom door, if you're having difficulties, if you're having a bad class, you can really feel that you are on your own. But the likelihood is you're not. So if you've had a bad class, you go to the staff room and you say, well, that was a bit, a bit of a tough class today with them. And somebody else will say, oh, do you know what? My class were just the same. They've been really difficult today. Or, you know, you go to, you say, well, how, how would you deal with this one? I've got John here and he refuses to do any work. What can I do? And other teachers will give advice, maybe people who also teach him or have taught him in the past. And they can say, well, this is what I do with him. Why don't you try something like this? Talking to your colleagues will really help you get good ideas about what to do with the class, but also help you to realise that it's not just you that um, it's something that uh, other people go through as well, okay? And that's a really important thing. All right, so now it's over to you. So it's our Q&A session now. So obviously the questions, um, uh, we only can only really answer questions about today's topic, so about classroom management. But I'm sure you've got lots of questions. So please um, write them in the chat and we can have a look and see um, 
what what questions you've got. While I'm waiting for some questions to come up on the, the um, chat here, um, I'll just mention about a seating plan. So that can be a really good way of dealing with behavior issues. Um, get people, you know, you decide where you want your class to sit. Um, and you organize a seating plan. Um, but um make sure that they understand that um the seating plan can be changed that you can change the seating plan right so if you think that it's not working um then uh you know you'll move them around as necessary okay well, we've got a question here from petro uh, what forms of punishment are deemed fair and not humiliating or abusive in any way? That's a really good question. Um, and it's something that I have to say has really evolved, even while I've been teaching, um, that there are certain, you know, lots of things that perhaps our teachers did in the past that we certainly wouldn't do. Um, you know, when I was at school, it would be perfectly okay to get somebody who's behaving badly to stand in the corner of the room. That's really not acceptable. Now, you really can't do that. And I did see a teacher a few years ago try to do that. I had to say to them, you can't, you can't do that. Um, it really, it really depends on, um, the situation you're in and the school you're in and to some degree the country that you're in as well um so um somebody here has asked about extra homework and that's definitely one way that i would go i would go with extra homework um so they get a certain amount of extra homework um depending on you know how how much of a, um how many how much sorry how difficult they've been in that lesson but I always make sure that the extra homework, uh, I always make sure that the extra homework is relevant to what we've been doing in class. Okay, so say in class we've been practicing the present perfect. Well, then the extra homework that I would give would be something to do with the extra homework. So it might be write a story, um, uh, write a story in the present perfect or write 10 sentences in the present perfect, something like that. So it's that, so it does have some relevance, um, and it's not just it's not just a waste of time. Now, a big thing about extra homework: if you ask students to do extra homework, check it. All right, not just have you done your extra homework. All right, fine. Actually, take time to look at what they've done, as you would do any normal piece of homework. Um, I've seen teachers in the past who um, students um, have done extra homework and the teacher says, oh, give me your homework. They get the homework, and they go like that, and they throw it in the bin. That is terrible, all right? That's just really disrespectful to that student. So please don't do that. They have, they've, they've done what you've asked, um, so um so you know like i say take time to go through it so thank you for that question petro okay so from cass here do you have any advice in regards to online students that might not want to do the work or may be having difficulties with getting the work done yeah so that's a very good question cass and what I would say is to use, um, there's quite a lot of um, 
websites or apps that you can use now where students are working directly onto worksheets, for example. So, you know, if you are if you were in a physical classroom, you might get your students to control practice where they're filling in a, a gap fill task on a piece of paper that you've printed. So obviously online, that's not really as easy to do. But there are websites. One that I use all the time is a website called Teacher Made. That's all one word. So if you just Google Teacher Made, it will come up. And what this website allows you to do is to get a PDF, so a worksheet that you would use in class. You create the spaces for where students, you want the students to fill in the answers. You can even fill in the answers so it marks it itself. So when you're in your online class, you give your students the link to that worksheet, they click on the link and they go through and do it. And while they're working, you can see what they are doing. And that's really useful because what I do while they're working, I'll say, oh, um, John, can you have a look at question three? Because you haven't got that quite right. And when you're doing that as well, it's reminding them that you can see what they're doing and you can see their work. So something like that um, will help. Uh, or if they're having difficulties getting the work done, it could be maybe simplifying it, but also using something like that allows you then to see what they're having difficulty with and you can help them directly then in the same way that you would do in the classroom. Um, so I just, so yeah, that's teacher made. Um, so I think that that's one that works really well. With having conversations, um, obviously in the breakout rooms and then going into the breakout rooms um i i find if anything i'm probably working even harder in an online classroom environment than i would be in a in a real class environment and that's because in a real class environment i can sort of take a step back i can sort of disappear and listen to like all the conversations going on around the room whereas if i'm in something like zoom i'm going into every classroom and it's a bit disruptive i'm you know but it's one of those things it's the way that it, zoom works but it does mean you can go in you can see what's going on you can answer any questions make sure that everyone's involved okay um so thank you for that Cass. i hope that answered your question it's a really good question thank you right so we've got a really nice question here from from Cynthia, what can be done about 11 to 12 year olds who laugh or mock other students? Um, stop them. Um, just in a situation like that, I would stop the class um, and talk in general about the unacceptable behavior. If so, you know, other things that you can do is to if you see that it's specifically aimed at one person, then you could write a note to another teacher. So you write a note to a teacher, you say, right, when this student arrives, can you keep them for two minutes, write something on this note and send them back. You fold the note up so they don't read it, you send them off, say, can you take that to, to that teacher? And then when they're gone, you speak to the rest of the class, and you say, what's going on? I see that there are some people being not very nice. To, to this person what why is it um because it's not acceptable okay um and that can be quite a good way of dealing with that all right but do stop it however you deal with it whether it's speaking to the whole class or doing an activity like a you might do a reading activity where somebody's being bullied or something like that or whether you send that student off and then you speak to the rest of the class, do make sure that you deal with it as quickly as possible. Um, that does also sort of lead on to, lead on to um, what happens when your students are laughing or mocking you. Now, there could be a few reasons why they're doing that. First of all, like we mentioned earlier on, as teachers, we're humans. That means we make mistakes. So if you make a mistake, um, 
you know, my problem is usually around drawing diagrams or drawing examples on the board that look like something completely different to what they're supposed to look look like. So if you do something, um, you say something and that happens as well, a slip of the tongue and your students laugh. I've seen teachers before who get embarrassed and they get a bit shouty and a bit defensive. There's no point. You've made a mistake. Just accept it. It's like, yes, I did just say that. Yes, I did just draw that on the board. Okay, fine. Um, if it's more malicious, then there are, again, there are different ways to deal with it. You might just ignore it because what you'll find is that they're looking for a reaction. So if you don't react to this, then um, it will stop. Or it might be dealing with it head on. You might turn and say, well, what did you just say? Why are you laughing? Right, so you deal with it head on because most of the time you say, oh, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, I thought so. Let's get on with our work, shall we? Um, so dealing with it head on like that. Another way is to have a conversation with a student one-to-one. -one. So at the end of the class, everyone's leaving. You say, oh, can you just stay, stay for a moment? I want to talk to you. And just ask them, say, what's what's the problem? I notice that every time I, I speak, every time I say this, you're laughing or giggling, so what's the problem? Um, and having that discussion with them very, very often can help to deal with any uh, difficult behaviour. And that speaking to them like that, speaking to your students, especially teenagers, like their adults, rather than talking down to them, um, can be really helpful be a really good thing okay so i hope that answered your question cynthia thank you and uh, let's have a look we've got another question here we've got arash okay what are the best methods for rewarding the active students this is a great question okay lots of teachers have got a lot uh, you know different ways of doing this um i have uh, and it really depends as well on the age of the students okay if you've got young learners they're quite nice and easy all right stickers i've got a stamp um i've got a stamp and it says mark says well done so when i've marked their homework they get a stamp like that if they've done their homework well or something that's great okay um with teenagers because of being more self-conscious um they perhaps don't want you sort of pointing them out in front of the rest of the class to say they've done something well all right so in that case if they're doing their homework it might be well done or excellent or something like that um as a general thing so um it could be that I generally do things like we'll have a game or we'll do something fun, which isn't even necessarily related to what we're doing. Um, so at the moment, like the, gr the groups of teenagers that I've got at the moment, um, pretty much all of them, they really like um, an activity called Mad Libs. Okay, so this is Mad Libs, which some of you may have heard of. So you have a story where some of the words have been taken out and all you do, so you have the story here um, and you tell your students, you say, all right, okay, this is a story about uh, a summer's day. Um, and then for each gap, it tells you what to ask them. So it will say like a pronoun um, or an adjective or an ING verb, something like that. So they all they know is the title and what you're asking so you ask them that you you write down what they say and then either you or another student can read out the story something like that is really simple they really enjoy that um kahoot as well um if it's not overused okay one less you know not one lesson sorry one kahoot every so often is absolutely fine um uh, 
rewards are whatever you make them okay whatever becomes a reward in your class so it could be doing a, a song activity which is something that we sometimes will do as a reward in my class okay um so that that becomes the reward so it really depends on it depends as well on what interests and what engages your students so you might find that you've got to try out a few different things and what works with one class is not going to work with another class okay so i hope that answered your question arash thank you for that okay we've got a really nice question here from samantha so what would you do if a student regularly doesn't do their homework or always has an excuse for uncompleted homework? OK. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, this partly depends on the, the school where you're teaching and what their expectations are. Um, so it might be that you have to raise raise a concern with your line manager for example um, it could be worthwhile as well first of all talking to the student to find out why they don't do their homework think about how they are in class so do they work well in class do they usually do the work pretty well do they understand everything or do they struggle so could it be that you need to slightly simplify their homework um, could there be another reason for it that you're not aware of okay could there be something going on at home or something outside of your classroom that you're not aware of and that could be the reason why they're not doing their homework so it could be worthwhile having a chat with that student and say right look i've noticed you're not doing your homework is there a reason for that and see what they say quite often it's i don't have time um that's the usual one and so then I, I talk to them and I say, look, I'm not asking you to do a lot. My homework, my homeworks tend to be around 20 to 30 minutes a week, a, a lesson, depending on the, the age and what I'm doing with the students, but it tends to be about that. So it's not a huge amount of homework. Um, so, you know, we can all find 20 minutes. As, as busy as we all are and everyone is incredibly busy, if a student says to you, Oh, I'm too busy, I don't have time. You know, don't say, oh, no, you're not. You're a teenager, you've plenty of time. Um, you know, do take what they say seriously. Say, okay, I understand that. You've got lots of things to do and you're busy at school, you've got exams and everything else. Um, but understand, I have to give you homework. It's what your parents want um, and so on. Um, and start by having that chat with them before sort of escalating it any further see if that deals with it um see and you can also see if there's any sort of changes that you need to make <coughs> um if it's just a, i'm not doing it that's it say so to them okay well your parents are expecting me to give you homework they're expecting you to do it um i might say to them if you if your parents don't want you to do homework that's absolutely fine it's not a problem but can you ask your parents to phone into the school um, or come in and let me know that I, they don't want me to give you homework and that'll be fine. I won't give it to you then. Uh, otherwise, yeah, get, get in, speaking to your line manager, maybe get in the school to phone home and seeing what the problem is. Okay. Um, but I think that chat, I think talking is really important. Um, you, you'll probably see that quite quite a lot in quite a lot of the answers that I've given you um, talking to them talking to them at the same level as well when you're talking to your your teenagers especially talk to them you know like they're like they're humans um, but which I, I know it can be quite unusual for them because quite often their teachers um, especially teachers at school um, they'll find they perhaps talk down to them um and so a different approach will get a different outcome so thank you for that question samantha that was a great question right um we've got another question here um from delph so what can you do 
when unscheduled noise hampers classroom activities, for example, maintenance work? Yes, Delph, that's a great question because what we're talking about here, really, so, I mean, you've, you've mentioned, you know, noise from outside, but this is really any outside distraction which is affecting what we want to do in our classroom. And it happens, okay? Whether it's, you know, building work going on outside, which is distracting, or like I said earlier on, snow or rain or, um, or the first day of school or the last day of school or anything else. Okay, there can be lots of things that happen outside of our classroom that are beyond our control. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing to do is to relax. Okay. Look at the lesson plan. Clearly, some things are going to need to change. If there's drilling and hammering and banging going on outside the classroom, clearly, I'm not going to be able to do that listening activity that I wanted to do. So we're going to have to do something else. So I'll be like, Pro, uh, if it was something like noise, I would just do like small group work activities, lots of talking, lots of discussions going on. Okay. Um, and just look at that. So look at the situation that I'm in. What can I do to make this a useful lesson still? So it's like when they come in and um, something's happened outside, which means they're really excited. They're really full of energy. And I've got a, a speaking lesson planned. It's like, right, okay, what am I going to do? So the first thing is to have an activity which calms them down. So it might be that I write a word on the board and I say, right, okay, you've got to think of as You've got to write down as many words as you can that are contained in this word. Off you go. Okay, something calming like that. That means they're working on their own, working on paper as well, not looking around the room too much. That will help to bring them down. Okay, the important thing, don't panic. Stay calm. Think, right, what can I do? How can I solve this problem? Okay, but that's a great question. Thank you, um, Delph. Okay, we've got another really nice question here. We've had really good questions this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, what can we do to make someone interested in learning English, especially kids, when they do not love, do not listen, answer and involve in classroom activities? Oh, yeah, it's a really good question. Because when you're thinking about children, you know, young learners, teenagers, why are they coming to class? Because their parents have told them to. Their parents are paying, their parents are bringing them, dropping them off. They probably have very little, if any, say in what's going on. So how can we make them interested in learning English? Um, we need to think about the activities that we're doing with them. Make sure the activities are interesting and engaging. Um, this happened to me before, actually. I was teaching a class that I'd been teaching for about two years. So I knew the class really well, um, got on really well with them, no classroom management problems or anything like that. Everything just went along as it should do. And then we had a new boy join the class and it was just like, it turned the entire class upside down. Um, and he just disrupted. There was no, It seemed to me that there was nothing I could do to get this boy to, to behave. And so after a few lessons, I kept him back at the end of the lesson. I said, can you just stay for a moment? I need to have a chat with you. And so he stayed back and I sat down with him and I said, look, every lesson we seem to be having a problem and every lesson I'm having to tell tell you off. And I don't really want to be doing that. I said, so, so what's the problem? What's going on? What What's causing you to be like this? I said, do you, do you not want to be here? And he said, no, I don't want to be here. My parents made me come here. I don't want to be here. And I said, right, OK. I said, I, that's and that's fine. And I can completely understand that if you've been made to do something you don't want to do, that you don't be very happy about it. I can completely understand that. I said, but what you've got to think about for a moment is that you are here. 
your parents are making you come here they're going to carry on making you come here and when you're here i'm going to carry on telling you off and you know dealing with your behavior because you're not behaving and you're disrupting the class so if you're going to be here why don't you try and get involved in the class a bit more try and behave a bit better you might find that you actually enjoyed and you might learn something and that's how the conversation went and i could never say that that boy behaved 100 percent. i can never say wow it was like a a, a light bulb moment and his life changed. no he was still a bit of a problem in class but it did change his behavior he did think about what he was doing in class I thought about what I was doing in class as well. So I thought about how I was dealing with him and thought about um, how I reacted with him. Okay. Um, so try and deal with it that way. All right. Talk again, again, talking to them, talking to them, see what the problem is. Um, and then, yes, looking at the activities. So if they're not engaged in activity, why? Is it, is it too difficult? Is it too easy? Is it not age appropriate? Um, when you're looking on like websites, you know, Na National Geographic, if it's anything like Nat Geo Kids or something like that, then your teenagers may not be very impressed with it, even though it's appropriate level, um, because it's kids, you know, things like that. So think about the activities as well. Okay, hopefully that uh, answered your question and helped. So thank you for that. Right, we've got time for, I think, one more question. So similar similar question to the previous lady, but I'm hoping to teach adults online with no previous experience of teaching. How can I keep everyone engaged by dealing with one student who is struggling? Um. Okay, so that's a really good question. So thank you for that. Uh, so if this takes a little bit of forward planning. All right. Um, so it could be that um, I suppose it depends on the activity that they're doing. So if it's like a control task where they're doing a gap, gap fill kind of thing, then you can work more with that one student um, while the others are are working on their own. So that's that's fine. You can use a chat facility as well to chat with that one student. Um, <coughs> um, you can, if it's uh, if it's a discussion activity, then I tend to f get involved more with that group to help that student and to make sure that i'm keeping that student involved um, it could be perhaps giving that student slightly simpler tasks you don't have to make it obvious um, you know you don't have to make a big thing about it just give them a different task to do um, can be one way around that as well okay um, i mean the thing is with you know, with all of your students, really, but with adults as well. Adults, you know, tend to be paying for themselves. And so it's easier for them to decide, oh, I'm not going to go back. Oh, I don't like it. So you need to create an environment where they're, they feel comfortable, they feel safe, and they feel willing to try things and an environment that they want to come back to. So working with that student, talking to them, um, helping them along the way, giving them more one-to-one -one support, um, but making sure that everyone else has got something to be getting on with. So it could be that you need to give the, the class another task to get on with so that you, while you speak to this student. And that could be something you have to do in face-to-face -face classes or online. So if you see that somebody's struggling, it might be right, okay, I need um, a task. So, okay, right, can you write um, five sentences about something you did last week in the past simple, if that's what you've been doing, um, off you go. And then that gives you a chance to deal with that one student and then everyone else is engaged, okay? 
Okay. Um, right. Unfortunately, there's a couple of questions there, but unfortunately, we're really out of time. Um, you've had some great questions um, this afternoon. So thank you very much. It's been really, really good. Um, but we are out of time. So uh, thank you very much for attending. Thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, you've been great. Your questions have been amazing. So thank you. Um, please take a moment to um, fill in the survey, um, which is also in the chat. Or it will be now. There it is yeah, in the chat. So please take a moment to fill in the survey. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you again here soon. Thank you and goodbye, everyone.